well. Now we're going to start our journey in chapter 18, which is the um, metabolism chapter. Um, this Most of this should be a review of the first couple of chapters in, um, in 210. So we're going to go and refresh your memory on organic compounds. <clears throat> Now, before we get into the specific uh, organic compounds, we're going to look at uh, just basic, even, you know, just fundamental terms. So nutrients, nutrients are simply chemicals that we're going to ingest or take in from the environment that we need. It is what's going to build us. It's not only the building blocks, but it's also the energy, as it says here, for the processes that's going to go on. So it's kind of the gasoline for our engine, but it's also the the bricks and mortar and, and lumber for our house. It's all of these things that we're taking in are simply called nutrients. And so they're in two major uh, classes, macronutrients and micronutrients. All right? Macro means big or a lot. Micro means small or a little. And so the macronutrients are the, um, the organic compounds. This is what our body is mainly made up of. So we need that in a in abundance. And then the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals, again, mainly um, the electrolytes, which we kind of just refer to as ions. Remember, sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, you know, we looked at those and how our body regulates them even in 210, right? Nerve impulse is sodium, potassium as it goes down, and then it's calcium at the very end. And also calcium is used for muscle contractions, and the muscle contractions uh, which drive the body, but more in particular, the ones that drive the heart. And so these are things that have to come in to help us function. Um, so these are um, what we're bringing in in the general category of nutrients. Now, some of these things we cannot make, or to use the proper science language, synthesize on our own. And so we actually have to obtain them in the form that we need them from our diet. Uh, our body can't reassemble things to put these together. So carbohydrates, right? when we look at those, the carbohydrates are um, going to be what we think of as sugars, but it's far more than sugars. This is the, this is the energy form or the, uh, the, the molecular form that our body wants given to it as energy to use to make energy. It is the main one is going to be glucose. We're going to look at some of that um, here in a second. Actually, the next slide. So carbohydrates um, come in a bunch of different forms. And there's, you know, again, like we said, this is what we consider sugar uh, in, in a broad category, but it's, it's so much more. Um, the word for it the building block is a monosaccharide. So if you imagine this wall and it's made up of a bunch of different bricks, each brick is a monosaccharide. That's, and that would be a single sugar, a, a simple sugar. Um, that's what a monosaccharide is. And that is what's going to be uh, the building block for larger carbohydrates. Now, the one main monosaccharide is glucose. Again, that's the, the molecule of energy. But we're going to bring it in from things like polysaccharides, which are much bigger. Um, in plants, all right, we, the plants, when they are making carbohydrates, because this is the main job of photosynthesis, it's making carbohydrates, making glucose, and it's going to store it in a very big molecule called starch. All starch is, is these single bricks, these monosaccharides, all plastered together into a big building. And so our, the plants store their energy, their, their, their monosaccharides, as these polysaccharides we call starch. Now, we do the same thing. Animals do it, only instead of a starch, what we store uh, saccharides in is called glycogen, and that's going to be stored in the liver. Now, there is a pathway that it goes through. If, you're, if you start at the building blocks, a monosaccharide, two single sugars, two monosaccharides will bind together to form a disaccharide. Um, disaccharides are, this is where you would hear lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. Um, so is uh, 
maltose and sucrose, those are disaccharides. Um, and so uh, disaccharides are when we're breaking down these polysaccharides and we're getting close to the end, um, but we haven't broken it down all the way. So that's what digestion does. It's going to take these complex, large carbohydrates and break them into smaller ones. And it has to be broken down to a monosaccharide to be absorbed. Now, there is one type of um, uh, carbohydrate, as it says here at the bottom, called cellulose, uh, which our body cannot break down. And it provides this, this uh, gastrointestinal janitor for us. It sweeps and it kind of, it helps push things through. And this is why we call it fiber or roughage. If you've ever heard of you need fiber, this is a type of a polysaccharide that our body can't break down. And so if it can't break it down, we, we can't absorb it. And as it moves through, it provides the, the bulk of uh, the mass that moves through that will end up being defecated. Now this slide is going to show the three different uh, monosaccharides or single sugars or simple sugars if you want to call it. Uh, the one on the far right is called glucose. You don't have to know these. You're not going to have to identify them from me or really in the future. But fructose, galactose, and glucose are the three main um, uh, monosaccharides. And when my body breaks these, these carbohydrates down and absorbs it in the small intestines, these three um, monosaccharides, as they get taken into the liver, the liver is going to modify the other two, both fructose and galactose, and modify it in the liver and convert it to glucose. And while that seems like something you just say, oh, that's, that happens in the liver, I mean, that's great. But just think about it. These are pretty close. Uh, the one in the middle, this, this galactose, if you look, it's only a switch of that second to last hydrogen and hydroxyl group. Um, that's the difference from side to side. But that's a big enough switch that our body couldn't use it uh, as efficiently before. So, you know, this is what's going on in the liver. Everything's being converted over to glucose as it's being pushed out. Now, just understand that also in the liver, as these carbohydrates, these uh, monosaccharides flow through, the ones that our body wants to store, it will package as glycogen and then stay and hold on to it in the liver in times of low blood glucose levels. This is a little flow chart that shows how the carbohydrates um, are breaking down, absorbed, and then used. So we start with uh, on the top level where it says carbohydrates, and it's got starch, which is a complex polysaccharide. Um, it is made up of long, you know, long chains of glucose. That's what starch is. And so digestion of starch is breaking down the starch to glucose. Um, sucrose, maltose, and lactose, like we said earlier, these are the, the three disaccharides that are the main ones. These are the ones that are two single sugars, two monosaccharides bound together, and that's what the digestion shows what they are. Maltose is two glucose molecules bound together. That's why it only shows the one molecule under it. Now again, not a big deal, but those on that level, those are the three monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, and galactose. And again, as things go through the liver, I'm going to convert galactose and fructose to glucose, release the glucose into the bloodstream. And this is going to tell my body, insulin's going to go with it. This is going to tell my body that it is time to use this energy. If anything needs to be done, done uh, any repair, that the energy is there. Now, on the other hand, our body also, we looked at, you've looked at in lab, will produce something called glucagon. This is going to cause the liver to take that glucose and start packaging it together like that middle arrow on the bottom called glycogenesis. It's going to take a bunch of glucose, package it together, and store it as glycogen. Now, on the left side of that bottom row, respiration, this is where glucose is being brought into uh, the cell. It's going to be broken down and produce energy. That energy there should say ATP. We know that's the molecule that our body uses as energy. And then on the other side, the thing that we don't like to think about, if we are bringing in a lot of glucose, 
and we have an overboard of it and we're not storing it, we, you know, even though we're storing some of it as glycogen, a lot of it will be turned into adipose, into a lipid and stored. And so this is what we don't necessarily want to talk about, but that's how adipose tissue is formed. Now, understand while all the organic molecules can be used for energy, uh, for fuel, it is carbohydrates that are the primary desired main source of fuel for cellular processes. We can use lipids and we can use proteins. If we have to use nucleic acids, then we're, we're in big trouble. But you can use the other two, but there are there's unintended consequences. There's byproducts in the breakdown of those. Glucose is the clean burning energy that our body is designed to run on. Um, so we need uh, carbohydrate varieties and individual energy requirements. I mean, again, my, your activity level um, is going to uh, determine your need for these. The more active you are, the more energy you need. And carbs, again, are the desired source of energy. Um, I'm not worried about minimal requirements. I want you to know that it is one of those things that's very personal. This is very average in here. Um, if you are someone who is constantly in motion and really doing a lot of activities, you're going to need more than this, this little range. And if you're someone that just sits around all day, you don't need to do that, but you don't need that much. Um, so as it says, our average diet has too much. But again, there's a lot of things about carbohydrates that we should look at more than just the general category. We need more complex carbohydrates in our diets. So now we get into lipids, or what we call fats, all right? It's an organic compound that includes fats, oils, and fat-like substances, such as phospholipids and cholesterol. Uh, lipids, again, is just like when we talk about um, carbohydrates and we think of them as sugars, lipids, we think of as fats. Now, one thing to understand, lipids are a category that does not play well in the body. It is a fat. Your body is mainly water, so fats and water do not mix. Oil and water doesn't mix, if you want to say it that way. Um, so these things, as they move around in our body, are going to have to have special carriers. Anything that is a fat-soluble substance, understand, is going to have to have some sort of special carrier for it to move around in our, in our body. I mean, our blood is, is, you know, over half water. And so in each cell in the form elements is mainly water. So it's even more than just half water. So if we're talking about moving a fat light substance or a fat or an oil inside our body, there's going to have special processes that need to be done. Now, um, uh, they do supply energy for cellular processes. It can be burned. It actually has more energy per, um, per weight than the carbohydrates do. Uh, but it just also produces a byproduct um, that can cause an issue. Uh, but they are building blocks for structures such as cell membranes. Again, remember phospholipids. The cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Um, but when we talk about the uh, dietary lipid, the main one is called a triglyceride. A triglyceride is the main dietary lipid. It is going to be... Um, a glycerol and three fatty acids. That's why it's called um, tri, a triglyceride. Glycerol, glyceride, I mean, the middle of the word tells you it's a glycerol, glycerol, and then three fatty acids. Now, these fatty acids can come in um, two main types. And so the next slide is going to break those down. So the two main types are saturated and unsaturated. Now, trans fat, or, uh, tri triglycerides, um, which are uh, the, the little three branches that come off, or the three branches that come off are called um, uh, fatty acids. So the fatty acids are going to be what determine the characteristic of the triglyceride. So we either have saturated or unsaturated. The word saturated means to not be able to hold any more. And so when we look at saturated fats, what's going to be is a chain of carbons where a, a hydrogen is every possible place. 
And so it's going to form this straight chain the way it looks. And that used to be called straight chain fatty acids because of that. But not a big deal. What I want you to know about saturated fats, again, there's a hydrogen at every place, so it is saturated. And it is going to be the main type of fat or lipid found in animal-based foods. So animal-based foods are going to have mainly saturated fats. Now, that is not a, a guarantee of all of them. Again, as it says in that second bullet point on there, palm and coconut oils have a lot of saturated fat in their plants. Right? But this is kind of the, the way that, that it is set up in general, that it is of animal origin. Uh, this is the one that's, it is in general solid at room temperature, like butter, uh, lard, you know, something like that. This is a saturated fat. The unsaturated fats are going to be from plants, generally speaking. Again, not a 100% not a rule, but very close. Uh, unsaturated fats are going to be liquid at room temperature, like olive oil, um, vegetable oil, and again, you know, whatever a canola is, a canola oil, um, they are, um, they're going to be, um, they're going to be liquid at room temperature. Now, there can be a wide range of them. The one at the bottom here, it says a monounsaturated uh, fat is the healthiest. Monounsaturated fats means there's only one spot where I'm missing uh, the hydrogens and I'll have one double bond. It's considered the healthiest. Uh, polyunsaturated means there's going to be more areas where hydrogens are missing and maybe not as healthy as the monounsaturated. Now, just to kind of point out what a trans fat is, is we want to take a saturated fat and turn it into an unsaturated fat. If we pull the hydrogens off to form this unsaturated fat, what happens is it bends, but it bends differently than in nature. And so we call it a trans fat. And while it looks almost identical, except this bend goes, let's say it goes left instead of right, my body can't recognize it. So it will stick to the arteries in my body and cause a problem. Um, so there, you know, that's why the trans fats are so bad. Now at the very bottom, there's something called cholesterol. Now cholesterol is a different type of, of lipid. Now, um, again, it is only found in animal uh, foods. It is not found, there is no cholesterol in plant foods. Now, before you think, oh, that's great, cholesterol is a name that simply means lipid-soluble steroid, all right? Every lipid-soluble steroid is based on the cholesterol uh, molecule. So before you poo-poo it, understand that it is something that is necessary in your body. We just don't need it to be in abundance. So lipids, um, lipids have a lot of different uses. Um, now they, they're going to be phospholipids, which help make up cell membranes. Cholesterol, which is the uh, lipid-soluble hormone. So in the endocrine system, all lipid-soluble hormones have their their backbone in cholesterol. Um, and then the diet is going to be what we call triglycerides. Um, they are a energy supply. Don't, you know, when I'm telling you carbohydrates are the desired source, believe me when I say that lipids are fine, but if it is your only use, it ends up being a problem because uh, they will, while they release more energy, they also produce something uh, that you will learn that's um, called a ketone body, which causes issues. But again, not trying to go down that little bunny trail. Um, so when triglycerides are broken down, it's a glycerol and the fatty acids, and this releases energy. Um, but those can be rearranged to store in, as fat in adipose tissue. All right, so excess glucose or amino acids, and whenever you hear amino acids, you should think proteins. Um, so excess carbohydrates and excess... Um, proteins can be converted into fat molecules. So um, it all funnels down there. If you have too much of something, that means you're not burning it off, then it will end up generally being stored as fat. Now this is a flow chart of how fats from foods can be broken down and then put into the, uh, get into the mitochondria. But as you'll see there, if you kind of follow that first cycle, um, as 
fats are broken down into fatty acids and then to acetyl-CoA, which is the last step, you know, in uh, glycolysis, that acetyl coenzyme A from the fats can turn into ketone bodies. And this can really play havoc with your pH. But just try to show you that this is, you know, fats can be used um, in this cycle, but there is a, a trade off, there's a byproduct that's produced. Now, the liver can convert fatty acids one from another. There are a bunch of fatty acids uh, that are present. Um, the ones that our body cannot make are referred to as essential fatty acids. This one lists one, linolylic acid, um, again, has to be obtained from the diet. I cannot make it. Now, this next part is pretty interesting, at least to me, I guess, when you, if you've ever had a blood test done, you might have heard things about your cholesterol levels, and they'll tell you the LDL versus HDL, and LDL are your bad cholesterol, and the HDL are your good cholesterol, and you can remember that HDL, you know, means happy, that that's what it is, but uh, it's so much more to it than that. So lipids, um, as we said earlier, have to have carrier proteins. They have to have some sort of invisibility cloak to travel through this liquid uh, body of ours, this, this water driven body of ours. So um, they form these little things called lipoproteins. Lipoproteins um, are going to be things that are going to have a lipid on one side and a protein on the other. And when we talked about emulsification, that's kind of the same thing. Because it has these two opposite acting chemicals on either side of it, it is going to allow for lipids to be able to pass through the body without pooling together, right? So the, the lipid portion of the lipoprotein will be on the inside attracted to the lipid thing, and then the proteins are, out, are on the outside, and that helps it move through the water. Now, there's three different types, VLDL, LDL, and HDL. As it says here, very low density lipoproteins are called VLDLs. Now, these are ones that are taking the triglycerides to adipose tissue, right? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, understand this is the one that would, we'd like to kind of control to keep from becoming, um, but from becoming too fat, becoming too large to put on extra pounds. It, this is what stores anything above my, my, uh, energy level as adipose. All right, so we're not going to talk about that because that's not fun anyway. The other two, though, I do want you to know something about. Low-density lipoproteins and high-density lipoproteins. I wish I could draw on this, and I, I know I can. I just don't know how to do it. So what I'm going to tell you is I need you to imagine these being taxis. All right, They are one-way taxis, and I'm going to say that I have a storage unit of lipids in my liver. And let's say instead of my liver, I'm going to say it's in my house, right? Inside a vault in my house. And I need to take it out to my business, like my, um, I need to take it to school with me. And so I have one type of, of this lipoprotein that takes the lipid away from my liver and out to my body. All right, so it's it's taking the the um, the fat out to my body. Those are called low density lipoproteins. Then, as they do their job, I'm going to have something called high density lipoproteins that's taking the fat back to my liver. So literally, I have one taxi, one shuttle bus that takes things away from my liver, one that takes things back to my liver. Now. If I have too much cholesterol in my body, that can cause a problem. That can cause placking. And so if I have too much LDL, too much of that um, lipoprotein taking the fat away from my liver, that's a problem. The reason that HDL is the good cholesterol is that it's taking cholesterol or lipids from my body back to my liver. 
if that if I have more things coming back to my liver than out to my body, then I will have less risk of having the fat or lipids form plaques in my arteries. So therefore, low density lipoproteins, the taxi cabs taking the, the fats out to my body are bad, where the taxi cabs that are taking the fat back to my liver are good. They're cleaning my body. But in all actuality, you want them to be pretty equal. While you do want it to have a higher content of the high density lipoprotein, HDL, you don't want it to be too out of whack. You need, it wants, it needs to be balanced. Right? So I hope that makes, that makes sense. But the liver is what's controlling that. And so the LDLs are bad because they're taking cholesterol and lipids away from the liver and putting them out to the body and therefore have more chance of sticking to the arteries. Or the HDL is pulling that cholesterol and lipids and pulling it back to the liver where that's going to make it easier or less of a risk to have arteriosclerosis. All right. I hope that that made sense. Now, this is the same little breakdown that we talked about with the carbohydrates. This is now looking at his liver, so I've, uh, or fats in the liver. So I've eaten uh, a kind of a fatty meal, a whole bunch of fried food. Mm. Uh, as my body breaks it down, the digestive process in the GI tract, the alimentary canal, is going to break it down to fatty acids and glycerol. Again, small intestines, this gets absorbed, it's going to go to the liver. At that point, my liver is going to modify those fatty acids into a bunch of different things that are needed. Again, some of it is going to be converted to other fatty acids, except, of course, the ones that can't be made. Some of it's phospholipids going to repair or make new cell membranes, cholesterol, more enzymes, or a uh, endocrine hormones, lipoproteins, more of these little invisibility cloaks. And then other triglycerides, which are just going to be you know, more energy. So the liver is doing a lot of stuff, as you can kind of see. Now, again, not worry too much about um, the requirements. These generally are going to change as we go through. Um, understand that uh, we need fat. We don't, you know, you know, no fat diet with nothing, that's not good. You do need fat. It's almost impossible anyway, but you do need fat. Um, you just need the right type. You need healthy fat. And you need fat that's not modified in some lab, right? So anyway. The next type are called proteins. So we've looked at carbohydrates, which were the sugars. We've looked at lipids, which we commonly call fats. Now we're looking at proteins. Proteins are, are kind of the normal thing that we think of as, as steak or whatever. And proteins are generally muscle. Um, as we're breaking down proteins, our body is made up of all kinds of things that are proteins. Proteins are so elaborate. And again, first of all, We've got to know the building block. The building blocks of proteins are amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids. Our body uses those to rearrange different things to form these long chains of amino acids, which we call proteins, which will have very intricate shapes to them. Uh, like we said, proteins are generally enzymes. The, an enzyme is going to have a very intricate shape on one side that's going to fit other molecules, and it has to have a perfect shape for that. It can't be off in any little bit, and that's the danger of what we refer to as um, denaturing or denaturation, where pH or something like that changes the shape of that protein. It's no longer functioning. But again, remember, amino acids are the building block. The amino acids are held together by bonds called peptide bonds. And again, most things, you know, you'll see pepta, like peptidase. If you remember, a peptide bond is between amino acids. That kind of is a good uh, rule of thumb that whenever you see pepta or something, it's usually referring to a protein. Now, they have all kinds of functions, as it says. Again, enzymes, um, hormones, antibodies, um, so, you know, there's a whole thing called plasma proteins that are we talked about when we were in the blood chapter. Um, now, they can be used to supply energy, um, but that is a bad thing. 
Um, they're going to have a lot of nitrogen that's going to have to be removed, and it's removed by the kidneys, but this can also, if you start doing this, it can start really throwing off your pH and cause some big problems. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Atkins diet was a very controversial diet, um, and, and when it said needed to be on doctor supervision, you really did, because uh, when you start just eating all proteins, you got some byproducts of the breakdown that can cause a lot of issues. So this, again, kind of shows how it's, it's used in the body, how it can be uh, broken down. But, so we eat uh, some protein, whatever it is, a steak, anything, um, or beans. I, you know, I don't have to put it as that, but, you know, protein. Um, the amino acids as, are what the final result is. So as I eat it, our body is unwinding that chain and then breaking it down into smaller portion smaller segments of amino acids until finally it's down to the individual amino acids and again some some protein molecules are thousands upon thousands of amino acids long so we're kind of having to really struggle with that as we break it down to absorb it now once we absorb it uh, on the left hand side of this picture you can see that it's going to be used the amino acids are rearranged they're like i just ingested a big thing of of Legos and I've got 20 different colors and I can use those Legos to make other structural proteins. I can use them to make enzymes or hormones or the plasma proteins. And if I need to, I can use it to make glucose. I can make glucose out of it. And, but the byproduct of that is also going to have some inner, you know, have some problems. I'm going to also produce some fat and some ketone bodies that will be kicked out at the same time. But so it's not desirable, but it is it can be used. This again is another flow chart. Again, um, as you start uh, producing different things to get to this acetyl CoA, you're going to be uh, kicking out a lot of this um, amine group, which is going to be urea, which can cause a good bit of problems in your body. But this is just a flow chart of how our body can break down. Uh, the proteins uh, and put it into the Krebs cycle. Now, um, there are several things that are high in protein. Again, um, you know, the, the main ones are, are animal products, um, but the also like nuts, uh, some beans and peas are going to have some, but not as much, you know, as, as animal stuff. Uh, eggs are considered the perfect protein almost. Our body needs 20 types of amino acids. Um, of the 20, eight of them are what we refer to as essential amino acids. Like we talked about with other things, these simply mean things that we can't make. These eight essential amino acids have to be brought in, put together already, and then we can use them. Now, um, in animal proteins, especially meat, they are considered the, and I don't want to say a, per, a complete protein because it will, every protein inside of meat is going to have all of the amino acids, the essential amino acids. Uh, so in terms of eating meat, it gives us all of that. When it comes with plants, uh, quinoa, I believe, is considered a complete protein, but I'm not. I don't. I haven't really done a peer-reviewed article check on that. But I know that for the most part, 99.99999% of all plant proteins are what are considered incomplete. There is outside of quinoa, there is no other plant that I know of that can ha that has all eight of the essential amino acids in one place. So that's why like por pork and be our pork, rice and beans, actually, even though they taste good together, they actually counter each other. They help each other because the essential amino acids that rice might not have, the beans will have. And how you combine it, it kind of helps put it all together. And again, um, this is going to be whole rice. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into the different things, but it is, it is, you know, where it's not cleaned out and bleached white rice. Just go in there. But anyway, um, I hope you understand. If you, uh, you know, I don't have anything against 
a vegetarian diet, but just know that um, if you're going to have a vegetarian diet, you really need to make sure you understand where the amino acids are that are essential and how to make sure you get them. Because if you miss one of those essential amino acids, you will have a lot of different proteins in your body that cannot be produced and that will be a problem. If you, you know, there are, there are plenty of people that are vegetarians that are very healthy, but if you've ever seen a vegetarian that just looks unhealthy and kind of looks like you're like, man, something's not right. Their, their skin just looks either too oily or not oily, you know, whatever. They just don't look healthy. They probably are not getting all of the amino acids. And that's a problem. Now, again, this kind of gives you an idea of um, the amino acids. I'm not worried about that. You can see that the E um, are the ones with the E beside them are essential amino acids. Uh, this goes into the complete and incomplete proteins like we just talked about. A complete protein uh, is generally going to be milk. It's going to be plant or uh, animal um, proteins. Milk, eggs, and meat are what they call a complete protein. Incomplete proteins are going to be things that are plant proteins that usually are going to be missing one or more of the essential amino acids. Um, and this actually talks about, you know, how different plant proteins can work with each other. Now, when it comes to nitrogen balance, I'm going to tell you I'm not going to uh, get too much into this. Um, proteins have a lot of nitrogen. So as they are being broken down, um, you can end up having a lot of problems um, if you have too much or not enough. Uh, so there is this dynamic equilibrium um, in, in us that's kind of trying to keep the nitrogen balanced the way it's supposed to be. So once we talk about the, the requirements, again, like I said, proteins uh, and carbohydrates, we're not worried about the requirements. I'm not looking at all the minutia of this and each individual, you know, 160 to 150 grams. I want you to understand that it is going to be your body monitors this and you want to keep a balance. Uh, if you're taking in too much and you're not exercising or using it, your body stores it as fat and, and causes all kinds of issues. Um, but you can have a deficiency of protein and it is a problem and, and it can cause all kinds of stuff. Like, even like it says here, the nutritional edema, um, you know, so it, it's, uh, which means that I'm going to have a problem with the osmotic pressure inside my, uh, cardiovascular system because I don't have the plasma proteins that I need. And so I'm going to keep this fluid inside my tissue spaces. Um, again, we talked about the way the, the circulatory works is that um, the capillary bed, um, it requires the plasma proteins, the osmotic pressure to pull the fluid out of the tissues. And so um, you can have, what you say, nutritional edema. So this gives a, a breakdown of the three major nutrients, and that's a, a pretty good uh, baseline. Uh, again, I'm, you know, we're not going to get this big in it. I definitely, carbohydrates, you need to know monosaccharides are the big ones. And you need to know that glucose is the main monosaccharide. You do need to know that our body stores it as glycogen and that plants store it as starch. And all those are molecules that are big groups of single, simple sugars, uh, lipids, the, uh, there are phospholipids in cell membranes. Cholesterol is what our body is the ends, is the um, uh, endocrine system hormone, a lipid soluble hormone. Everything's based on. But the one I really want you to know here is a triglyceride. Triglycerides are um, uh, three fatty acids on a glycerol molecule, and those three fatty acids. Uh, they're going to be in one of two categories, either saturated or non-saturated. Saturated means there's a hydrogen at every level. Unsaturated means that there is something missing and it ends up bending. Um, saturated fatty acids are fatty acids that are found in animal products in general, where unsaturated are found in plant products. 
unsaturated, the ones that uh, are animal are generally solid at room temperature like butter or lard, whereas the ones that are unsaturated are, that are plant fats are liquid at room temperature, olive oil, um, corn oil, stuff like that. Finally, proteins. Remember, pro proteins are simply long chains, uh, chains of amino acids um, and that uh, they are going to be uh, formed into proteins as it goes through. Um, and that there are eight essential pro amino acids that are needed. Um, animal products in general will have complete proteins, which means we'll have all eight of those essential amino acids, where plant proteins generally won't have that, and you have to know how to combine them. So at this point, we look at energy expenditures. Understand everything's about energy. Um, and so when that's what when it says counting calories. When I'm eating something, the calorie level is how much energy is in the food I eat. If I take in more calories than I am burning, that means that I am storing it. This is so you that's why it's important kind of to be active. Um, you know, you want to make sure there's a balance. Uh, excess, as it says, can lead to obesity, which ends up being a problem, uh, and again can cause, uh, it can even cause death. It'll it'll definitely damage your health. So a calorie, as we said, was just simply the amount of energy that's inside of food, um, and it's there are a calorie is a unit of heat. Actually, again, I am not going to get into this, but I want to point out that lipids have almost twice as much uh, calorie per gram uh, because they are so densely packed. Now, again, there are, the problem with it is there is a byproduct uh, as it gets burned as it gets used that can end up being a problem. So we have something called the, the basal metallic rate, BMR. A lot of people have probably heard of this. Remember that basal means bottom. Basal means bottom. So if something is basal, that means it's at the bottom. The basal metab metabolic rate, metabolic rate is the energy expenditure. So it's saying once my lowest energy expenditure. So it says you're going to test it when you're awake and at rest after overnight fasting. You know, so what they're looking at is, you know, I'm not exercising. I'm not scared. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, nothing startled me. I'm just sitting around resting. What is my metabolic rate there? And again, it's going to vary with everybody's, um, everybody's, uh, lifestyle. Um, so anyway, uh, this is how our body kind of measures. So if I'm taking, so if I'm just sitting around not doing anything, exercising and eating, I'm going to end up having a problem with this uh, balance. This gives an idea of how many calories per hour you build. I just think this is amazing. Walking upstairs is double swimming. It's it's almost double running or jogging. Um, so, I mean, this is a, it's a big deal to walk up. And now I grew up, uh, I've always been kind of in the Southeast and, and it's been generally flat, but I lived on the North part of Atlanta for a while and uh, actually in Nashville too. And I would live in areas that had a lot more undulation. So when I'd go for a daily walk, I mean, it was an exercise because when you're going uphill, it's a lot harder than if you're just walking on flat surfaces. So anyway, I just always think the walking upstairs is amazing how many calories per hour it burns. So this energy balance that it talks about is just saying that, you know, I want to know what my normal body expenditure is, and I want to give it the appropriate amount of calories for that. Too much? That's a problem. Not enough? That's a problem. I want to get close to that little sweet spot of getting it pretty balanced. Now, I will go ahead and tell you that I do not care for this. Uh, BMI, body mass index, uses the, is used today to assess weight, taking height into consideration. This is, we need to be real careful when we start boxing things in. Um, your body 
size and makeup is different from person to person. And so this can end up being really uh, not fair to look at, just to kind of say, this. I'm sorry, I talked as it went over, but I, uh, this chart is what we're talking about. Um, this is a chart for the body mass index. So I am 210 and am 6'2". I am overweight and one step away from being obese. Now, I might be out of shape, but I don't think that I'm one step away from being obese. Um, this is a very tough thing. And I'll tell you, my brother, um, who was in the military, he was in the Air Force, and he's a couple inches shorter than me and a, and a much bigger guy, um, and he's mainly muscle, uh, he always had a problem because they could look at him and see how big he was, that he was in shape, but he would always have to do so many other things to prove that the BMI chart wasn't telling that he was, he was obese. He's about six foot and probably weighs about 280. Um, not 280, good grief. I'm sorry, about 260 still. That's, that's up there, but, um, you know, he is not obese by any means. So anyway, just be careful. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the clinical ap application of this, but it, it, obesity is a big, big deal. I mean, it is the cause of so many diseases, and it's because we have a tendency to think of, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, malnutrition being something that is bad. But malnutrition just means bad nutrition. And you can have too much and be a problem. And that's kind of what we have, right? Again, not going to worry too much about this. I do want you to know about insulin. Um, as insulin, as we eat and we have a sp uh, spike in pr uh, glucose, our body will send out insulin that um, will help other cells start pulling in glucose and using it. It's basically telling the cells of your body, hey, you've got energy, time to use it. Um, and, and it also stimulates the, the liver to start storing glycogen. Uh, the other ones I'm not going to worry about. So vitamins, vitamins are uh, a really important part of the body. The vitamins are essential nutrients. Um, or they cannot be synthesized by body cells. And so we have a lot of vitamins that we need. And so we classify them into whether they're fat-soluble or water-soluble. You do need to know that the fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K. Um, and the water soluble ones are all the B vitamins and C, right? A, D, E, and K are fat soluble vitamins. Remember, fats can can move through cell membranes like they're not there. So if I have uh, vitamin E um, gel cap and I squeeze it out and I, I rub it on my hand, it will be absorbed into my body. And um, so that's a, uh, an important thing to remember. B and C vitamins can't. These are some fallacies and facts about vitamins. Uh, the more vitamins, the better, and that is not, uh, not true. Now, water-soluble vitamins, we just pee them away, but fat-soluble vitamins can cause serious issues, and it's mainly because of their ability to move through the cell membranes. Uh, we can, you know, people think, oh, my diet's fine, I get plenty, but um, you got to be careful, you got to know, because... Uh, not every diet is, and, and a lot of people just listen to what other people say and uh, can cause real problems. Um, they, you know, vitamins do not directly s supply energy, um, but they can cause a release of the energy from the uh, carbohydrates, so, you know, kind of help trigger, uh, you know, we don't get into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle into the little parts, but there's a lot of parts of B vitamins. So sometimes if you take certain B vitamins, you can have this really bad uh, energy um, release that, that can make you really jittery. But it's not really the, it just helps the machinery work faster. And so sometimes that's a, that can be a problem. 
So fat soluble vitamins obviously are um, they are nonpolar. They're not going to have anything for fat soluble things to grab onto. That's why they don't mix well with water. Um, so they've got to be broken down and absorbed in the same way that all lipids are absorbed. Um, and need bile salts to help emulsify them. Um, they can be stored in moderate amounts, but um, uh, you can overdose on these. Um, the one thing about these is actually they're not really heat resistant. They're fairly, uh, they're fairly easy or fairly strong in not, you know, being able to resist breaking down by cooking, but they, you know, all, sunlight can actually do more damage to them than the heat of cooking. This is a great little chart of these. Again, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to use this to, to make questions off of. You know, I, I want you to know vitamin D for sure. You should know vitamin D. We talked about it back in the skeletal chapter in 2000 and, and uh, bio 210. Um, vitamin D is needed to absorb calcium. We talked about the regulation of calcium. Uh, vitamin D, uh, because it helps uh, absorb calcium. If I have a deficiency, then I'm going to have what we call rickets, where the bones um, are, are kind of uh, rubbery. Remember, they, you know, I don't, have, uh, I don't have the calcium in it to give them strength. So we talked about the little kids with the bow legs in the, in the third world countries because their, their bones didn't have the calcium to give them strength. Um, so anyway, these are, this is a good thing to look at if you're interested in vitamins and you'll probably will get into them in the nursing program. Uh, be good to have, uh, know where this is. Water soluble vitamins B and C. Uh, now these these do get destroyed in cooking, um, uh, but B vitamins, like I said, are very important for cellular metabolism. They're a big part of the Krebs cycle uh, and some of the stuff that goes on. Um, and generally, these B vitamins are found in the same group. Uh, that's why they're called uh, vitamin B uh, complex because there's a bunch of them that generally are found together. This is a good breakdown of them. Um, this is a uh, really, uh, there's so much to these B vitamins. But again, um, I'm not going to, we're not going to get into the different individual ones. I do want you to know they're water. Uh, this is continued on. And then finally, vitamin C. Again, whenever you hear uh, vitamin B12, the thing you need to think of is automatically think of intrinsic factor. Vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor are, uh, I clicked too early, vitamin B12 is there. Vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor are linked at the hip. Uh, so on this one, we talk about minerals. Now, minerals are um, going to be ions. They're going to be calcium and potassium and sodium, um, zinc. Um, different minerals. These are going to be the things that, that are uh, also going to help. Now, remember, vitamins and minerals are really big in uh, helping to, to unlock the enzymes. Their vitamins and minerals help enzymes work. Right? So, again, um, they're usually extracted from the soil by plants. That's generally where we get them. Or in animals as well, because the animals eat the plants. Minerals make up about 4% of body weight. And the most abundant one we should just know, which is calcium. Um, the bones in the teeth, which are bones, are made up of calcium phosphate. Uh, so calcium and phosphate are the two largest amounts of, mineral, of minerals in the body. Um, because the bones in the, um, in the teeth are the main part. So anyway, um, there is iron and hemoglobin. Uh, again, calcium is going to be in different areas. You're going to have sodium and potassium and neurons. Uh, so they've got all kinds of things that are going on. Um, so minerals are a very important thing, but you can end up having too much of a mineral. So you got to be careful of toxicity. This lists the major minerals, and again, the first two, the top, the, 
the top two, calcium and phosphorus. It is because they are in bone, calcium phosphate. Um, now, that's why it says at the bottom, calcium phosphate account for 75% by weight of the mineral elements of the body. I mean, the majority of it, three quarters of it, is going to be just the bones. Um, but understand sodium is the kind of star of the show because it's the one that's going to control a lot of different things. This gives a list of where the major element minerals are. Um, the next we'll continue on. Again, this is uh, some of the major minerals. Very interesting. I mean, again, good good reference. And so, you know, when you get into uh, nursing or whatever, this is going to be a big deal. I'm not going to test you on these. Then we have what we call trace elements or micro minerals. This is just stuff we need in small amounts, but there's they're very important. Iron. Our body has a hard time absorbing iron. Our body does a lot of stuff to recycle the iron we have, but you know we need all of these. A little bit of iodine, um, you know, zinc. So these are all different ones that we need in small amounts. Now these trace elements, um, there's a couple, this is another little group, uh, and we're going to have another slide here in a second of the trace elements. These are just simply the, the ones uh, that are the most common, and again, I think that um, this is a good area to know, but I'm not going to ask you a lot on this. And I'm not going to ask you a lot on this slide as well. Again, I think that it is really good to kind of know and understand. You'll see where it'll come in and play as you get farther along, but I'm not going to uh, be testing you on this. Again, uh, clinical applications, I usually don't test on it, but as I'm going through the slides, just going to bring this up. I'm not going to test you on this, but when it comes to dietary substances or supplements, be very careful. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff out there, and so there's a lot of things that end up relying on your um, placebo effect, so to speak. So just be careful. Healthy eating is kind of a, a big thing, uh, really. I mean, and it's so much more complicated than anybody that, that gives it credit for it. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, we probably, as a general rule, don't you know really control our eating or think about it. We just do our normal stuff, um, but we probably should look at it every now and then. Um, it, we need to eat in accordance to our active, our, our activity level. Um, you know, you don't want to eat too much and you don't want to eat too little. You want to kind of balance everything out. Um, this next slide's about is gonna we're gonna talk about different eating types, but then we're gonna talk about the food my plate, as it says here. It, you, it replaces the pyramids, but it's you know it's changed a bunch of different times. There's a lot of things that we need to think about. I'm not a real big fan of my plate or any of those uh, general things. These are different types of the vegetarian uh, diets. You can have vegan, which is no animal foods, ovo-vegan, which is eggs are allowed but no dairy or meat, uh, lacto-vegan, dairy is allowed but no eggs or meat. I'm not going to ask about any of these. Uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you. I want you to know vegan means no animal foods. This is that my plate. Again, they change it over and over again. I, I will tell you, um, really, you just want to eat things that are as minimally processed as you can. Uh, the more processed things are, the, the the worse it is for you. You know, my grandmother, you know, they grew up on farms and they, you know, they ate butter and bacon and, you know, they ate eggs all the time. I mean, that was a different way of life, but th most of that stuff was grown right there outside of their door. Um so there's a lot of things that we need to watch. I mean, again, my suggestion, this is a good rule of thumb. I just think that it we shouldn't have to have, we should be have more common sense on it. Anyway, that's my two cents. Again, not worried about clinical appl application. If you're going to be an athlete, you really need to know, you know, 
nutrition is a huge thing uh, in athletics. And if you're going to be an athlete, you need to be a scientist as well. You need to know about how to eat. Because then we get to uh, nutrition and malnutrition. I said this before. Malnutrition simply means poor nutrition. Um, you can have overnutrition where I take in too much and that's considered malnutrition which is where I think America kind of is in general. Um, now there's either a primary or secondary malnutrition. Primary malnutrition is simply bad nutrition from diet alone. Secondary malnutrition is when I have some sort of defect if I've got um, my, my gallbladder has been taken out as it says and I have a deficiency of bile or, you know, if I just have something wrong with my intestinal tract, secondary malnutrition, anything that gets in the way, which means no matter how good my diet is, how, how much good stuff I eat, if I have something wrong in my GI tract or somewhere along the path of getting the nutrients to my cells, that's secondary malnutrition. Not worried about this. I, the, you know, again, as it says, the human body can, can survive about 70 days, 50 to 70 days without food. Again, it all depends on your condition when you start different, you know, a bunch of different stuff. Um, your body will start breaking down itself. Again, um, you'll, you'll have, a, it'll be very noticeable as you start starving, as things start, um, start having an issue. Again, uh, this gives different, uh, this gives different names to stuff. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of really sad, you know, diet can be very mental and um, some sad things in there. I'm not going to test you about those. And again, I think this is the last slide. Not worried about the calories per day. This is a good rule of thumb. I'm not going to test you on the, the very one, you know, these specific numbers. I would hope you would see that um, that uh, males have a larger calorie count uh, per day than females, and as someone ages, they have less uh, energy requirements. And so, it, you know, it slows down. Your everybody's metabolism is going to slow down. Well, that is the chapter. Uh, that is chapter 18, the metabolism and nutrition chapter. I hope that this uh, works out well.